Okay, my friends, I welcome you to St. David's and to this second Sunday in Advent. And as I said, this Advent calls us to a positive and hopeful response to the difficult reality in which we live, a call to open our hearts to the hope, love, joy, and peace that will guide us onto an Advent that matters. This Advent and Christmas, we are invited to make ourselves ready to raise our voices with good news, to charge our hearts with love and get ready to be transformed because now is the time. This day we embrace loving confidence that we can do what needs to be done to bring more light into the world and affirm that we can still believe even when we are discouraged. In both scripture readings this morning, a messenger appears as a sign from God, heralding a new era. In each passage, the words, do not be afraid, appear, offering a clue that the messenger, whether prophet or angel, was referencing something that induced fear in the recipient. There is so much fear in the world. There is a fear of the other and of the unknown, fear of the pandemic and uncertainty, fear of the future. And this morning we hear stories of profound love that enabled people to overcome fear, to not lose heart, and to bring healing and hope into others' lives. And we are encouraged not to be afraid, to know that God is with us and calls us to be love in action in the world. Thank you. 
see what love can do to break down barriers caused by fear and invite acceptance. two verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Peace be with you. And I invite us to pass the peace as we've been learning. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. So as we know, Advent is a season of waiting for the rebirth of the great light of love to shine its healing and transformative light into all our dimly lit places. And throughout Advent, we are encouraged to find ways to let our light shine every day in ways that bring light to others' hearts. As we continue to learn about the importance of music in making the world a better place, and the power of love, we hear more about the story of this little light of mine and how this song became a light of hope and love during exceedingly challenging times. Human history is replete with racism, prejudice, and hate toward the other who is different and perceived as dangerous. And much human suffering has been caused by our inability to see every person's precious divinity and humanity. And this has led to brutality and violent disregard of human dignity and human rights. This little light of mine shines on as a timeless tool of resistance and love. A woman named Fannie Lou Hammer sang it on a bus one day that police had stopped. And the words became a significant unifying song during the civil rights movement. Freedom singer, Rutha Mae Harris was one of the original freedom singers, a group of black women who came together in Albany, Georgia in 1962. And their mission was to raise money and awareness for the civil rights movement. Music was an anchor, she said. It kept us from being afraid. You start singing a song and somehow those billy clubs would not hit you. And it played a very important role in the movement. This little light of mine as a beloved children's tune is recognized around the world, but it is also a gospel song which was transformative or transformed into an, an anthem of singular power. And the song 
has the same impact in today's times where people are denied their dignity and human rights leverage its message to push back against injustice. Harris said, you can't just sing this song, you must shout it out. And so as we sing two verses, the song reminds us of the incredible bravery and courage of people unwilling to let their light of humanity be dimmed by the fear others have of them. delightful to see Deb, our tech person, up in the balcony dancing away, <laughs> making it a very joyful uh, singing of that song. Each week during the series, we hear a passage of comfort from the prophet Isaiah. And this is a prophet who wrote in a time of exile and suffering. And it feels at times that we have been exiled from one another and from the rhythms of life that settle us. This Sunday, when love is the Advent focus, two passages bring talk of signs of God's presence, God's love, but also of God's challenge to us to get love right. Some of us may be theologically skeptical about saying it was a sign from God, but signs were important to ancient peoples. Think of them as symbols, tangible things pointing beyond themselves to some more significant concept. The sign that comes up in the complex Isaiah passage, fraught with the politics of the day and plenty of fear of annihilation, is a child. And children were often used as signs in the Hebrew text. And certainly as we look at this symbol found in both readings, we see the child is used as a sign, a glimpse into the future. And this future is one of hope, Emmanuel, God with us. We are not alone in our suffering, in our fear, in our worry about the future. A reading taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verses 1 to 4, 14. In the days of Ahaz, Jotham's son and grandson of Judah's king Uzziah, Aram's king Rezin and Israel's king Pekah, Ramalia's son, they came up to attack Jerusalem, but they couldn't overpower it. When the house of David was told that Aram had become allies with Ephraim, their hearts and the hearts of the people shook as the trees of a forest shake when there is a wind. But the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shearzashub, at the end of the channel of the upper pool by the road to the field where laundry is washed and say to him, be careful and stay calm. Don't fear and don't lose heart. Then Isaiah said, hear now you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? 
Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Matthew's original story of Christianity begins with a long genealogy including the connection to Isaiah's time. And in this gospel, the author connects the past, present, and future struggles of the people. As we heard in the Isaiah's reading, and now in the gospel, the child is seen as a hopeful sign that God is with the people in all their struggles, past, present, and future. In the following passage, we hear of Joseph's radical act of love in a situation that gave him every reason to walk away. And the messenger says, don't be afraid to do the hard thing here. This reading is from Matthew 1 verses 18 to 24. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph, before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Because he didn't want to humiliate her, he decided to call off their engagement quietly. As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he, just, he did just as an angel from God commanded and took Mary as his wife. Here ends the, the reading. Our worship series, I believe, calls on the power of sung poetry that inspires those who hear it to a brighter tomorrow. And as we are learning, music has often been the soundtrack of hope, healing, change, and reconciliation. 
And this morning, the story of music to heal and reconcile comes to us from a documentary called Girls on the Wall. The teenage girls of Warrenville Prison in Illinois are not your average delinquents. Having graduated from juvie to prison, these kids are most likely to remain in the correctional system their whole lives. They are also some of the sharpest and most irrepressible young women. The girls of this Heartland prison are given an unlikely shot at redemption, the chance to write and stage a musical based on their lives. And they must relive their crimes, reclaim their humanity, and take a first step toward breaking free of the prison system. The documentary bears witness to the anger within these girls, the reality of their violent pasts. And we see the root of that anger, the longing for love in spite of all the defenses. And as you watch, you want them to experience all the love that has eluded them in their life. Girls on the Wall is also a story of movie director Heather Ross, who was given permission to enter the prison, a highly remarkable accomplishment. Ross's radical love broke through the hard shells of these young women put in place when their dignity and humanity had been violated and abused. What do we miss when we judge too quickly or dismiss too soon? From this documentary, we learned that love rises in your heart when you have no barrier between yourself and another. When you meet and observe people without judging them. Ross demonstrates a deeper love, a love that does not fear the other, but holds a listening space for people. A love that suspends judgment, and takes time to see fully the other, being with each other in the ways that Emmanuel, God with us, came in human form. That human form, the child grew to be a person who showed others a profound love that they had never experienced. So we're going to see a clip of the actual movie uh, as it was being done rather than a trailer of the movie. ago, I spent nine months in a girl's lockup. I was shooting a documentary chronicling an unlikely program, the writing and staging of a musical behind bars. People are always curious about what it was like shooting a movie inside a juvenile justice facility for girls. And even more curious about what it was like to be a resident there. Well, it wasn't what you'd expect. When you first walk into Warrenville, there's layers of gates and layers of security doors and metal detectors and stuff. Um, once you're in, it's it just it kind of takes you by surprise. Y'all make me nervous with that camera. I expected to meet a lot of really hardened, tough kids, and I was actually surprised at how welcoming most of the girls were. Nice, you guys. Bye. But it didn't necessarily mean they were totally open to outsiders. Hit me off that camera. Early interviews are pretty awkward. I'm nervous for on the camera. Are you? Yeah. Start by just saying your name. Tell me more about that. I feel that it was like... <laughs> like I just can't sit down and just meet you and just pour my heart out to you. But if we talked before and I think I could trust you, then I'll talk to you. Sometimes it took handing over the camera to let the girls feel more in control. I hope you're not recording. <laughs> you got kind of stiff right there, like. <laughs> Think about your own personal story. Think of something that, really something that really happened to you. We're gonna put some of this together so that by the time we get to the fall, you will have a beautiful script. Some of these will become songs. So that's what our goal is. Another interesting thing was that to a lot of the girls, writing music while locked up wasn't a foreign concept. Tupac been in jail, Big Smalls been in jail, 
A lot of them. 50 been in jail. Young Buck jail. been in jail. I mean. You know R. Kelly been in jail. I got his mug yeah. shot. <laughs> Especially when they grow up in bad neighborhoods, well, as we call it, in the hood, you know what I'm saying? The ghetto. And go through a lot then. Like Tupac, a lot of his music I relate to because he yeah. real. A lot of them write sons while they in jail. I write my sons while I'm incarcerated. The girls took the idea of personal music and ran with it. And they wrote everything from introspective songs for the musical to freestyle rap. But ultimately, the relaxed atmosphere of rehearsal was the exception, not the rule. I wondered how much of the sense of humor that a lot of the girls had was actually a necessity for coping with lockup. I just furnished my new house. You want to see my new house? Okay. I just come on, let's go look. Look at this. Nice. Nice. Oh, yeah. We got a good toilet. You see, the attic toilet, they got them, the metal ones you picked up at the toilet. Look, they got them sitting here. Looks like a plastic baby. No, that's just baby down. Yeah. Come on. Oh. That's baby. <laughs> Ultimately, the musical was both an escape from the anxiety of being incarcerated and a direct confrontation of the situations that had led them to lock up. I'm really grateful that I got to witness this process, and I will never forget Warrenville and the girls. I spent nine months in a girls' locker. I invite us to listen to a song entitled Love Has Broken Down the Walls, written by Mark Miller. The original title was Christ Has Broken Down the Walls. And this hymn has significant or special significance in a world divided by many issues and by walls of separation based on gender, ethnicity, race, color, faith, political position, and many other global divisions. The words are, love has broken down the walls. Let us join hearts as one. We're accepted as we are. Through love's power, all is reconciled. Cast aside your doubts and fears, peace and love freely offered here. We will tear down the walls. We will tear down every wall. Love has called us, one and all. Love has broken down the walls. And this anthem has become a favorite of youth choirs who are using music to proclaim what it means not to fear the other, but to be accepting and loving to heal the global community. And this anthem reminds and calls us to break down those walls between us, just as Jesus broke down the barriers and reconciled people one to the other and to God in the name of love.
This year, through our Giving Tree Initiative, we are supporting the Stony McDougall Society Christmas event for the Stony Nakoda Nations families. And I asked Brenda McQueen, president of the society, to share her story of love with us that brought her to where she is today as the president of the society. Brenda graciously accepted my invitation. So I invite us to listen to her story of love. My name is Brenda McQueen. Reverend Peggy asked me to provide a brief presentation on my relationship with the Stony Nakoda Nation, reflecting on the topic of love as the Christmas season approaches. For those of you who don't know me, my great 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 grandfather, George McDougall, built the little white church that stands on the 1A Highway just outside the town of Morley. That was way back in 1873. I am the past president of the charitable organization that owns the land and takes care of the historic site on which the church sits. One of the cornerstones of our organization is to work with the Stony Nakoda First Nations, whose land borders our site, and provide any charitable assistance that we can. During the previous three years, I was the president of our society beginning a few months after the historic church burned down in May of 2017. Of course, our immediate focus was the restoration of the church, but I made it a priority to also restore our relationship with the Stony Nakoda Nation. Many members of our society are descendants of the first settlers in this area, and we feel a deep-seated connection to the nation. We have worked with members of the Stony Nakoda Nation throughout the restoration process to ensure that the proper spiritual ceremonies were held and at all times respecting the wishes of the elders. Last summer, the church restoration was begun and it was a time for us all to listen to one another's stories and begin to heal a relationship that had become strained over the years. This fall, the church bell was raised, starting with the smudge ceremony, and the doors and shutters were installed on the new building. The exterior of the building is now complete, except for a few small details. Throughout the winter, work will continue on the interior of the building, and the mezzanine is already in place. Next spring, the restoration will be complete, and the church will look exactly the way it was before the fire. This journey has been very powerful for me. The site has always meant a great deal to me as a child, but I never anticipated that this path on which I started three years ago would impact the rest of my life so significantly. The Stony Nakoda people like to communicate by telling stories. And this is the way that they share the history of their people and their land. So I would like to share a few stories that show the long connection there has been between my family and the Stony people. I hope you enjoy them. My great great grandmother, Elizabeth McDougall, lived out at the church site for over 25 years. One of my favorite stories about her is the New Year's Eve dinner that she and Annie McDougall threw on December 31st, 1899. This was the beginning of a new century, and despite all of the hardships and personal tragedies that had occurred over the past 25 years, there was still a sense of hopefulness with the coming of a new century. Elizabeth had dedicated her adult life to helping her Stony Nakoda friends and this dinner proved to be no exception. 
Over 600 people were served party meals in several shifts throughout the day in that tiny church. And remember, this was without any running water or electricity. It was their love for the Stony Nakoda people that gave them the strength to endure extremely difficult conditions and to give everything they had to feed their friends, not only during the holiday season, but really any time they could. A similar story was told to me by my father when I was a child. He would tell me that when he was a young boy, he would go for Sunday dinners to his grandparents' house near the Elbow River in the Calgary community of Mission. Every dinner, several stony families would just drop by to join them. They never knew who was going to come each Sunday, but it was an open invitation for all to come every Sunday of the year. My grandparents had very little money, but they provided all they could for their stony friends. Inspired by these stories, I encouraged our society to create an annual Christmas feast to be held in Morley. This year has been a little difficult due to COVID, but for the two previous Christmases, we have provided a full turkey dinner with all the trimmings and provided gifts from Santa for any child that attended. Last year, we served over 450 dinners and handed out more than 200 gifts. Over the years as a president, whenever I talk about my work with the Stony people, I keep telling them that I feel it in my heart. I have felt the strength and compassion of my ancestors very deeply throughout this journey. The stories I have told you today are one of the many powerful reasons why I have felt that connection. Who would have known that over 120 years apart, my great-great-grandmother and I would be helping out the Stony people in such similar ways? I have made many lifelong friends among the Stony people, and these relationships will be the foundation for stories that I can pass down to my own grandchildren. From visits to the ICU to pray for ill family members, to helping out as a liaison with the Stampede, I hope to be able to ignite the same passions and love in the hearts of my descendants for the Stony people. Our collective story is almost 150 years old, but in many ways, I feel that it is just beginning. Thank you so much for letting me share these stories with you today. And I hope that they have enabled you to see the love in my heart that pushes me forward every day. I know that I have felt so much love from so many people over these last three years. And I have learned of the love that my ancestors had for the Stony people. I like to say that this is a path that not only I have chosen to follow, but one that I have somehow been destined to take. I feel as though everything in my life has been leading up to this moment, and this is where I am meant to be. I have literally walked on the same ground as my ancestors did with the descendants of the Stonies that they also walked with. It is truly astounding how this love has lasted for so many generations. Thank you, Peggy, and thank you to all of the St. David's congregation that has provided assistance to our society over the years. We could not have restored the church without your love and support. In times when humanity disappoints, perhaps when even our own thoughts and behaviors disappoint, it is necessary to call out, name and claim the consequences of our wrongs. And in times of distress, it is a prophetic act to call out, name and claim our belief that love can change the world. Let us responsibly speak these statements 
of belief. I believe that we have been taught to fear one another and I believe that we are capable of learning to love. I believe that this time of physical and ideological division will end and we will not have to sing and celebrate together again. I believe that our society is built on a foundation of oppression of some over others and I believe that they can speak this truth and move to act in ways that balance this negative. I believe that we are afraid and I believe that we can lean on each other and God for courage to face anything. We believe even when we are discouraged. We believe, we believe that, that when we are discouraged, raising, raising our voices of love will offer us hope. And now we move into our prayers in the stillness. And I invite you to get in a comfortable position of rest, to get as quiet and still as you can, to take a deep breath and put yourself in a deep listening posture, perhaps eyes closed or fixed on a candle as we prepare for a time of prayer. wakeful and the exhausted we lift our prayers in the light of love 
We wait for divine love coming among us this Advent season, as people have for thousands of years. We wait with love, wondering what each day will bring. We wait with love, hoping that we will have the courage and perseverance as we continue to live life in the middle of a pandemic. We wait with love and with hearts ready to still see goodness and beauty all around. God of love, we also prayerfully wait with concern for leaders, pastors, and teachers. They struggle with exhaustion, endeavoring to find ways to keep people, children, parents, congregants connected and work to be positive and encouraging. We prayerfully wait with concern for all those who work in the medical professions and on the front lines. We prayerfully wait with sorrow for those who suffer hardship and the breakdown of community among us, for all who grieve and whose hearts are fragile. We pray that encouragement, support, love and care will hold them in comfort. We prayerfully wait with concern for the brokenhearted and the downtrodden, for those who are homeless or struggling to make ends meet. We prayerfully wait with concern for those who are broken in body, mind and spirit. We prayerfully wait with concern for the single parents who are forced to choose between paying rent and buying food, for people without work and lost livelihoods. We prayerfully wait with concern for all whose circumstances we do not know, but who need a special blessing at this time. And we prayerfully wait with a deep hope that this world's people will see with sacred eyes, recognizing your divine stamp on every human face. Life-giving and loving God, unleash your abundant love among all people. Restore to all of us a spirit of hope, courage, and renewal. Restore to all of us a spirit of generosity and commitment toward one another. And may the spirit of Christmas give us the faith and the bravery to live as visible signs of the spiritual values at the heart of the ancient Christmas story. Hope, peace, joy, and love. In this Advent season and throughout the year, may we widen the doors of our hearts and our homes, letting your light stream out to the wider world we pray in the name of the one who showed us your way of love. Amen. So while we are not gathering in worship uh, in-house, just want to remind uh, all of us to continue our financial support to St. David's and a deep thank you from all of us for your endeavors to do so. A few announcements. Vera Moore celebrated her 75th birthday on Friday and Sylvia McDonald is celebrating her birthday today, so wouldn't it be nice to sing happy birthday?
and to anyone else who's celebrating a birthday in this month. And so we take opportunities during the Advent time to fill our hearts with love this week. And so I invite you to keep in mind our Giving Tree um, requests and the uh, organizations that we are supporting. And as I mentioned in the email sent earlier this week, that Chantal is here at the church on Monday and Wednesday to accept uh, any of the um, gifts or cards that you want to drop off. And I thank you for supporting our giving tree this year. And so we go forth during this series, we're acknowledging that we cannot sing together, but we are gaining a greater appreciation for the way music has brought and continues to bring hope and healing to people during suffering and challenging times in their lives. And each Sunday, we learn more about a carol of resistance. And this week, it is it came upon a midnight clear. It came upon a midnight clear. It was written in 1849 by Massachusetts Unitarian minister, Reverend Edmund Hamilton Sears. He wrote this carol, The Angel's Song, from the wellspring of his profound faith in God and his belief that God sends God's emissary angels to earth with a resounding message of peace. He also wrote this song while recovering from a devastating illness and from the depths of profound despair. In 1849, when Reverend Sears wrote his carol, the United States still reeled from the aftermath of the Mexican War and the burning issue of slavery that in another decade would ignite the Civil War. Europe reverberated with revolutions and people all over the world warred with themselves and each other. No one seemed to be listening to the angels' song of peace. This carol reminds us that we are to listen to the angel chorus and then join in, raising our voices with the message that love, not hate, is the answer. So let us sing, it came upon a midnight clear.
So you are invited to pick up this week's candle and prepare to take it to reside in the wreath you've made if that wreath is situated somewhere else than from where you are seated. We wait for justice, but we do not wait to work for change. We wait for restored health, but we do not wait to work to heal. We wait for wholeness, but we do not wait to work at binding brokenness. We wait for peace, but we do not wait to work to eliminate hatred. So my friends, like bells ringing out the news that God is with us, Emmanuel, and continue to fill the night left by sadness with messages of love, Go into your lives, humming the tunes that keep that life, that love alive in you, and that spur you on to your work of justice and reconciliation. Raise your voices and repeat after me, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. We will not be afraid. We will not be afraid. Amen. Amen.